Go ahead. Good morning. I am your alternative dose to caffeine. Um, so I feel weird, like I should be not giving you a science talk with this gizmo and all that. I should be giving you jokes, but uh, so, uh, but I won't. So uh, how do we get the, uh, wait, camera is light action? <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. I think people can, can, can use an extra minute this morning. <laughs> okay. So, so I think a lot about how to interpret variation that we find in humans. I think we can all agree that the, by and large, the problem of deriving genome sequence has been resolved to a certain degree. And the majority of the problems that we're facing in that regard at the moment are money, storage, and the FDA. That's about it. Uh, the third of the three statements is going to be more acute because the more, um, okay. I, I don't want to get into this, but we, I think everybody here understands what I'm, what I'm saying with the impending change in the regulations of, of DNA sequencing being a device and whatnot. However, I think everybody here appreciates, uh, perhaps more acutely than I do, because a lot of people here are on the front lines of this battle, that interpreting variation in humans and being able to give something credible back to families and, and, and derive clinically actionable um, outcomes is incredibly hard. And in fact, I would argue it has become even harder in the post-genome era simply because we now appreciate truly how much variation there is. And perhaps our previous interpretation used to be very, very simplistic, whereas now we're just confused. So. In 1901, uh, I picked this date because this is the date that William Bateson published Principles of Heredity. This is the rediscovery of Mendel's laws. Um, and I would argue that, so I, was, I, was, uh, I, I do spend some time, from time to time, and so for the, for the people who sort of were just entering science, I really need to tell you there was science being done before the internet. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is absolutely true. I have seen the data. Um, so in 1901, this book is not on the internet, although you can purchase it through the internet. Um, uh, Bateson uh, sort of prefaced uh, Mendel's discoveries, and I think it's a worthwhile read, and, and I would encourage everybody to do it. Uh, but what, uh, what I, uh, I surmise from this is some basic questions that I would argue that are, were true in 1901, they were true today, and I think they will be true for a long time to come. And I really want us to come together and start thinking about these things. We all want to know what variants cause disease. This is what this game is all about. And I'm sorry, it's not a game in the haha -ha sense, obviously. Um, we want to know what variants are associated with disease modulation. Because many of you who see patients will know that you will, dis you will encounter 10 individuals with exactly the same mutation, the exactly the same gene, and they will have variable clinical expressivity. And that is really important. And this is an area that we really do not understand because what we don't understand is what the effect of variation, of genomic variation is, is in the context of a single human being. Everybody tells this thing like personalized medicine. I'm sorry, I would love to have a practical definition of what personalized medicine is. A colleague of mine basically first said, medicine is always personalized, it's, between, it's a personal relation between the, a, a physician and their patient. And I fully subscribe to that view. Uh, however, beyond that, precision medicine, we all uh, get buzzwords out, maybe to try to get, to, to get uh, you know, shake Congress out of a little bit more money, maybe. Um, but the, at the end of the day is that we are not really able to execute this because we cannot understand the effect of variation in the context of another three billion base pairs, epigenetic profiling, and, and micro and, mi and micro environmental stressors. And that's okay. Or is it? The bottom line is, genetics as it stands today, is more akin to archaeology than forward-looking science. And let me assure you, I'm not a cynical individual. I'm a blue sky kind of guy. But the bottom line is, we can only make... The, people don't want to know what the probab epidemiological probability is for the little child to die. People want to know what is going to happen to their kid or to themselves, right? But, what we, but, but genetics always re reverts back to history. It's no, diff it's no different than going to the site of the ancient battle, I've said this a few times, e examining the relics and deriving which general attacked from the north with how many troops and what the spears looked like. But this is a limited value is to, into predicting when the next battle is going to happen. And we're really uh, struggling with this. We're trying to transition 
from understanding historical consequences, the history and the archaeology being an individual genome of events that have already happened. Because, you know, m m by and large, health healthy people don't go to the doctor to get sequenced. Like, doctor, I have a really serious problem. I'm feeling really well. It just doesn't happen. To being able to use genetic information as well as, as, as well as clinical observation to synthesize these things together to gain predictive value that will actually be actionable and helpful. It is also true that right now all we're doing, well, no, that's not true. Most of what we're doing has no value to the patient. The value comes for helping families cope with disaster. Very high value of this. I'm not belittling it, but let's be honest. We are dealing with helping families cope with disaster, and in some cases, depending on the circumstances, helping them make choices for future, future productive choices. That is the number one impact of genetics right now. The rest of it is just observational theory at the moment. It will change. Why is that? It remains true that our ability to interpret genetic variation accurately is modest. It is improving, but it's modest and it's leaky and it's dirty and it's not fully clinically actionable. Why? Because most of the time, I mean, I, I'm sure many people in this room are spending their lives worrying about this, the end of one problem. I got one kid with one mutation, a gene that I know nothing about. Or even if it's a gene that I know something about, that this mutation has not been seen before. This kind of stuff. In silico prediction tools, they're not, not can be noisy, I, I'm being a little generous, are incredibly noisy. The, the sensitivity, I know people here bellyache a lot more about two words that maybe the basic science are not bellyaching as much, and these are sensitivity and specificity. So we all know that the analytic sensitivity and specificity of polyphen and, and, and SIFT and VAST and whatever else you're going to throw at it is about 70, 75%, which means your prior probability is you're going to get it wrong one out of four times, which means that this is not good enough. It's a good effort. It works very well to write your next cool paper, but it's not good enough to actually um, balance that with a potential detrimental effect to a family and a patient if you were to get it wrong. And that's where we are at the moment. So what are we going to do about this? So... I've been thinking about this problem for a little bit of time, and it seemed to me that one solution for a subset of diseases, this is not a panacea, um, but one, one solution would be to actually be able to derive assays of high sensitivity and specificity, or at least quantifiable sensitivity and specificity, that would be applicable to test the effect of variation and ask a very simple question, is the allele that I just found benign, in a, in a sense that is relevant to the organism? So I had the opportunity to move to Duke um, and to set up the Center for Human Disease Modeling and it does exactly what it says on the tin. It models human genetic disease. The idea is that we derive phenotypes orthologous to the human pathologies observed and we test the effect of variation. And our ambition is to actually test the entire morbid human genome. And we've made a dent. Uh, so far we have uh, assays for about 600 human disease genes and we have tested about 1,300 variants, and I'm sure actually this slide is a couple months old, so the numbers keep racking up. So this is the other genome project, you know? So let me show you what this looked like. Um, we cannot study all phenotypes, so, you know, uh, clubfoot, not so easy. Um, but, get it? <laughs> uh, but there are a number of things that we can study. For example, here's a pathology, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this one where the, 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 the chief indicator is head size, head circumference. So this is something that is modelable. Uh, we can observe both microcephaly and microcephaly. These are quantitative uh, statements, and, and we can actually study that. We can look at cerebellar hypoplasia. We can actually study the integrity of the cerebellum. In the, the key thing here is that the pathology that we study in fish, uh, which is a, a, a prime model organism, is it has to be orthologous to the pathology observable in humans. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Otherwise, there's no credible way of transitioning the knowledge across with high sensitivity and specificity. So cerebellar hypoplasia, we can actually uh, do uh, quantitative measurements. Um, we can look at optic nerve art atrophy in cases of glaucoma. This is the actual optic nerve. We can measure its thickness. And this is a direct surrogate of what happens in human cases of both congenital and primary open glaucoma. We can look at gut motility uh, in a number of ways. Uh, and this is a very useful assay for, structure, for structural gut defects, primarily having to do with issues of innervation and, 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 and ability to execute peristaltic movements. Um, we can also look at the innervation of the peripheral musculature um, as a very strong surrogate. Uh, actually, hey, no, this, is, this, is, this was just got accepted. 
um, uh, we, we can actually measure the elaboration uh, of motor neurons um, as they innervate the per peripheral musculature as a, as a surrogate. This for the nervous system. Uh, for other major organs, we can also look at these things. This is one of my personal favorites. Um, we can study a whole host of craniofacial abnormalities, getting surrogate measurements uh, using the pharyngeal skeleton of zebrafish embryos that is highly reproducible with, with a subset of structural defects that we see in humans. It doesn't work for everything, but for the things that it works, it works very well. And it's a lovely assay because it's a natural stain, no antibody, and we can actually do this in a couple of days. Um, I can also tell you, I, don't have, I haven't brought the data with me today, but I can also tell you that we've now built um, semi-automated imaging tools, and, and our ambition is to be able to study about 50,000 embryos per week. Uh, so this is, that's why we chose the system, because we cannot get to these numbers. And we have to get, this, we have to get to these numbers because you all have been really busy uh, generating exome data from all sorts of pediatric patients that we're interested in. Um, we can look at a subset of cardiac malformation. I'm showing you here a classical left front axis determination defect. This, uh, this was a patient with heterotaxia uh, for whom uh, we, um, we, we, we derived this assay. So the kiddo had heterotaxia. Uh, um, the, there was a candida gene. Uh, we, we tested the gene in the allele and indeed, indeed we were able to uh, reproduce the left front axis determination defect. Um, we can look at issues of vascular integrity um, by looking uh, at the elaboration of vessels using uh, a variety of transgenic lines. Bless you. Um, uh, and we can look at subsubsidies of renal atrophies and cysts. I'm, I'm presenting this to just give people, everybody, a flavor of the types of phenotypes and pathologies that we have access to. Uh, I, can, I can make another 20 slides of the phenotypes and pathologies we do not have access to. Uh, but these are some of the things we have, we have experienced some success. Uh, and last but not least, we can actually um, study the integrity of the muscle. Um, this is actually uh, a surrogate of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, uh, and it works very well because we can look at both at the uh, rate of uh, death uh, of muscle fiber, but also more intricate things like detachment of my fibers from the Z-disc. And we can actually, if interested, we can actually dig in a little bit more and do cell biology. There's a lot more that one can do in terms of, you know, derive protein and RNA and do omics, transcriptomics, proteomics, whatnot. But the basic idea is generate a phenotype, just generate a phenotype. And ask the question one. Question one is, if I hit this gene, is it going to reproduce the phenotype of the kiddo? And question number two, if I'm going re to rescue this phenotype with human mRNA, can it rescue? And then if I introduce the mutation that I found in the kiddo, can that still rescue? That's the fundamental test. And we do this thousands of times. So I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about uh, examples of copy number variants. I'm, I'm going to touch very briefly on complex traits, and, and then I'm going to talk about the task force for neonatal genomics. So over the next two hours... <laughs> okay, so very briefly, uh, this is a copy number variant that is occupying a lot of people's attention, and it is occupying a lot of attention because it is associated, it, is, it seems to be um, contributed by 1.6% um, of uh, autism. Uh, it's pretty deterministic, it's highly penetrant, the deletion is very penetrant. Um, and also the duplication uh, contributes to both schizophrenia, about 1% of individuals with schizophrenia have it, and, um, and, and a smaller fraction of individuals with autism, but the penetrance of the duplication is much lower than the penetrance of the deletion. And, and it's, the, it's the classical copy number variant problem, right? Um, it's a 600 kilobase uh, region, and it contains 29 genes. So we became uh, intrigued by this because of this yin-yang phenomenon where the deletion was mirroring some aspects of duplication. So let me be very clear, I cannot study autism in fish. In fact, uh, like I like to say, I have strict instructions to my postdocs not to interview the fish. Um, and you cannot do gaze aversion in fish. Um, so, um, and they don't talk very well either in general. So however, however, so we can't study autism or indeed schizophrenia in fish. And this business about, oh, are they swimming together? It's like, come on, give me a break. <laughs> um, however, we can, the, the, this particular CNV has a strong comorbidity where the deletion is macrocephalic and the duplication is microcephalic. And of course, head circumference, this is derived from this course, of, of course, head circumference is something we can actually study. So the experiment that was executed was cool. Uh, the experiment that was executed was to actually take all the genes under the copy number variant region, 29 of them, overexpress them in pairs, uh, just to save a little bit of time, and ask the question whether overexpression of any of these genes would actually induce a head circumference defect in fish. 
I'll be honest, I did not expect this experiment to work. But it did, because this is the actual result. This is the, the, um, this is, um, this is the, um, me the median distribution of the distance between the eyes as a surrogate um, for head size. Um, uh, in in a, you know, a few hundred fish scored here for, the, for a combination of genes, KCDT13 and CDIPT, and this is the rest of the genes. And so this was the only genes that gave something up, and what was really cool is that the phenotype was reciprocal. So the, you control embryos have sort of this head size, and then when you suppress them, they, um, the, this increases, and when you um, overexpress them, they decrease. So they become macrocephalic upon suppression and, and microcephalic upon expression, which is exactly what the human patients with this particular copy number variant have. So what was interesting and very gratifying to this is that genome-wide association studies subsequent to this actually landed association with schizophrenia right on top of this gene. Uh, and so, so it, it works. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time. I can tell you we have done this for another 30 or 40 copy number variants. Uh, some of them are very well known and famous to everybody else, um, like you know aspects of the DeGeorge region and things like that. Other variants are things that are popping up uh, newly in the various clinical microarrays, and we don't know what the hell to do with them. So it works. It's hard uh, because sometimes, obviously, there's a lot of genes involved. Complex traits. Just two quick words. Um, Question number one is, we can actually do a burden test. So this is back to autism. It seems, it seems it's, a, it's a disorder that has been very amenable to us. So a little while ago, Aravinda Chakravarti at Hopkins approached me um, and he said to me, you know, we seem to be getting a lot of hits in delta catenin in females with autism. Uh, what do you think about this? I said, I don't know, uh, but let's test. So delta catenin um, is a gene that codes a protein that regulates wind signaling. And we can, of course, study wind signaling fish. And the point I'm trying to make here is that sometimes when you, when you can't study autism itself, you can study a direct chemical surrogate if you have very high confidence of its biochemistry. So delta catenin, we know a lot about its biochemistry, and we also know that it will induce this called non-canonical wind signaling phenotype in fish when it is suppressed. We can actually test this, and then we can actually rescue the phenotype with human mRNA, and it does rescue. So it, look, it goes from sort of this kind of pathology to this. And then we can engineer each of the point mutations that have been found in the female cohorts and then execute something called a locus burden test. And the idea here is that you don't have enough power to do an association for a single allele because, the, you know, it's like one in 150 cases and zero in 1,000 controls, right? You don't have enough power. But you can actually collapse all the variation in a single locus and say, I found this many variants in the cases, this many variants in the controls. If you do this for pathogenic variants, because you have been informed, you know, this variant is pathogenic, this variant is benign, um, then you can actually uh, ask the question, how much detrimental variation do females with autism have this locus? And it turns out that this was genome-wide significant. Um, so this was kind of cool, um, and, 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 it, it, and it demonstrated, it taught us also, well, it didn't just demonstrate, it taught us uh, a new trick of how to do locus burden tests for complex traits. Um, but uh, the one that I, I, I like to talk about a little bit is something called restless leg syndrome. Now, a lot of people will say restless leg syndrome is a condition, it's not a disorder. Many of us have it, you know, twitchy legs and all that. Um, so, and fish, in case you didn't remember this, fish don't have legs. So how are we going to study that? Well, it turns out, again, um, so Julian uh, uh, Winkelmann, uh, uh, a dear friend, uh, executed a genome-wide association study on this, and, 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 and she had actually found a very strong association with a homeodomain gene called MACE1. And there was some other data that suggested that MACE1 might be our guy, so she went ahead and carpet bombed the locus. She sequenced it in something like 3,000 cases and 3,000 controls. And what she found was there was an apparent increase in non-synonymous variants at this locus in individuals with restless leg syndrome. And this was actually significant, but this p-value is not exactly uh, making us do uh, cartwheels, you know. It's, it's, it's significant, but again, in the background of low variation, we're a little bit, um, we're a little bit uh, weary. Now, the important thing to say here, actually, that the, that the relative risk is between 1 and 4, if you have a rare variant in this. So, it's the usual complex straight jump, right? Whoo, we found another locus that explains, you know, 0.3% of risk. <sighs> That's really helpful. Um, so, um, and you can see the numbers are not small here, right? Okay, so fish don't have legs. However, we do know that MACE1, the homeodomain gene, actually regulates early neurogenesis. This has been shown in the mouse. This has been shown in other systems. 
So we were actually able to study the optic tectum. This is, this is a portion of the zebrafish head. The eyes are out there. This is the midbrain and this is the cerebellum right here. So we can actually study the size of the optic tectum uh, because this is a site of acute neurogenesis. And this actually decreased when we, when we, um, when we suppress MACE1 um, and it, it, it is restored by and large when we suppress MACE1 and we introduce human MACE1 and RNA. And then we can take all of you Leanne's var variants and do exactly the same thing as we did with delta catenin, la 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 la, and you get a picture like this. You get a picture like this where some variants are hypomorphic, some variants are null, some variants are benign. So, you know, uh, there is a benign variant, th and there's a null variant, there's a hypomorph variant, and so on and so forth. And the point to make here is that, the other point to make here is that these are surrogate data from thousands of fish observed. So the, our, 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 our interpretive power in terms of statistics is very, very high. And the p-values here are in the third and fourth and fifth and sixth decimal, depending on who want them. So this is the allylic series. This is what I was trying to tell you uh, earlier as a burden test. MACE1, uh, these are all the alleles that we found in cases. These are all the alleles that are found in controls. And now we can go ahead and annotate them as benign, pathogenic, or whatnot, hypomorphs. Uh, and we can observe this a typical complex trait that there are control individuals who, are, who do carry some pathogenic variation. But the amount of pathogenic variation that is carried in the cases is much higher. In fact, the OR from G was, was 1.8. The OR from functionally tested rare allele burden is 30. That means that if you actually have a rare variant in MACE1, that are a coding variant in MACE1 that are functional data say that it's a loss of function alleles, you're 30 times more likely, more likely to develop restless leg syndrome compared to the general population. Now, I can actually use this information because this is not fully predictive, but a lot more deterministic than this puny 0 point da. But here's the thing, I gotta tell you, we were, we were excited, we were writing the paper, we had the conference call with Juliana and her colleagues, we were a little cocky, truth be told, you know. And Julian says, wait, what about the blah, 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 the, these, uh, uh, actually, it's, I don't want to say them out loud, but these, these are the mutations. What about these Q3 and 6, da, 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 mutations? I'm like, uh, they're not on the protein that I see. It's like, oh, but they're on the long isoform. I'm like, what long isoform? <laughs> so it turns out that MACE1 encodes two splice isoforms, and they differ from each other at the C terminus. One of them has an extra bit. So we tested this earlier, but of course, when you move to another splice isoform, you have to go back and retest everything, to be honest about it, when you, you have to execute a test. And it turns out every single variant tested is benign. Every single allele is benign. Okay, so here's what this means. The good news is that we can now get a handle on the biology of this damn thing and understand why you're hitting MACE1 with severe alleles and individuals only get restless legs. I mean, most homeodomain mutations cause really bad things to people. Our, 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 our hypothesis that this is true is that because these mutations are executing a deleterious effect in the short isoform and in the long isoform, um, they're, they're not doing anything. So humans can actually go through their neurodevelopment just fine. And it is giving us an opportunity because if we can start understanding the differences in the function between the two isoforms, we might be able to understand why you get restless leg syndrome. However, that's not the point. There is, so in the lab, uh, a long time ago, we invested in obtaining a compendium of cDNA clones for the entire human transcriptome, the ORF collection, 16,000 open reading frames. The only reason, the only reason we tested our alleles in the short MACE1 isoform is because that was the plasmid that we had. There was no, nothing else, which means that had we by chance and chance alone had had the plasmid that is encoding this isoform and have done our work, we, have a, 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 we would have arrived at the interpretation that all these variants are benign and that coding variants in MACE1 do not contribute to restless leg syndrome, so it must be a no coding variant. That stuff freaks me out, <laughs> right? Because we have a realist, and, and, and I'm not going to go into this too much, but we actually suffered for this. There was another story that we did a few months ago, and something called BRF1, on a craniofacial disease, where the yeast data 
and the human genetic data were indicating that the alleles will also function, the fish data was saying benign, 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 and again, it was another isoform specific story. So it, it, it just keeps reminding me of all the potential pitfalls, and it also keeps reminding me of how we need to be able to have more than one types of testing on any different type of allele to get a better opportunity to catch these errors. Okay. So the bottom line is, can we use what all we've learned to go systematic and go prospecting the clinic? So about almost three years ago now, we set up this task force for neonatal genomics. It's a hybrid structure of Duke, and it's the single hardest thing I've ever done as a scientist. No question. And the reason is because we're trying to merge the fork-leaf clover that many of you are fully familiar with. W clinical management patient interaction, policy, sequencing, and in vitro and in vivo assay or protein function with accompanied sensitivity and specificity tests. And yes, we return fish results to patients. And just in case you didn't know it, they love it. They love it. Okay, how does this work? Like everybody else in the planet, we're doing trio-based whole exome sequencing and coming soon to a lab near you, whole genome sequencing, right? Because now the, 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 we are, we're about to cross over on cost considerations. But in, 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 and, and with respect, um, in difference to the, the rest of the planet, I choose not to read the literature after exome analysis because I live in the world where a significant fraction of the literature is incorrect, or at the very least biased. So what we choose to do is we do functional testing of all segregating alleles in every exome that we find. So on an average, on a child of a Northern European descent, we will have five to 10 kinds of genes. These are the recessive and the novels. We don't study dominant families. They're nightmares for us because they would come down about 70 genes through the pipeline. Mixed ethnicity families are a true nightmare because of the uh, uh, poor annotation of databases uh, and, and a small number of control individuals we'll have. But by and large, we will test 510 genes and we will ask the question, suppression or overexpression of each of these 510 genes, which one of those will um, phenocopy what the kiddo has? And then once we do that, test the allele. So let me just give you a quick example. And, I, you know, and, 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 and I hope everybody accepts that this is not like, you know, my perfect exemplar. It's not. Um, so and we, don't study we do not study thousands of families. We study in the low hundreds uh, because this is uh, a lot more labor intensive compared to the, 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 the classical bioinformatics approach. So here's a kiddo, neonatal seizures, microcephaly, dysmorphia, hypotonia, syndactyly, and so on. For this particular one, we got a little lucky because um, post exome, we only found one credible hit. Uh, I mean, of course, we found, everybody finds mucin and titin, right? Those of you who, who do exome sequencing know it's like everybody's got a mucin mutation, everybody has a titin mutation. Right? But in this case, we actually found recessive mutations in a gene called ELK3. And that was the only thing that came up. CNVs were clean, uh, no other rare alleles. So ELK3 is a transcription factor in the MEK-ERK pathway. So this is making us think about Noonan, Kabuki, Costello, Leopard, you know, this stuff. So uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> OK, so the, the long and short of it is that <clears throat> if it was an oral isopathy, we have to test this. And, and we, uh, we took a hook on the dysmorphia of the child and the head circumference. And this is what it looks like. So we suppress the gene in the fish, um, and we look at the angle of the serotohyal cartilage as a very good surrogate for micrognathia. Um, and we also, uh, because you, you, I hope you can appreciate, this is the actual jaw, and this is the actual jaw in, in the absence of the gene, okay? So this is a capture of direct surrogate, um, and this is head circumference. And we were able to show that the two alleles that we, f that we found in the kid were only able to rescue the phenotype partially, suggesting that these two mutations are hypomorphs. Now, if there were nulls, the child would have perished during early gastrulation. You cannot survive in the complete absence of maker signaling. You just can't. Uh, but there is some activity, but not enough. And, and of course, we run some controls. Now, this was first in human. And of course, you know, these are newer technologies, so everybody's a little bit uneasy about this. However, we move forward with a genomic hypothesis. And what we actually did uh, is we said, well, we know a little bit about this stuff. And we know there's another other pathway. So the question is, if this keto truly has a rasopathy of sorts,
can we predict other clinical comorbidities? I will never forget the day I went to the internist and I said, what does her hair look like? And, and, and he looked at me as if I was alien, you know? And I was like, what does the child's hair look like? Because of course, patients with rust defects often have coarse and brittle hair. But this is not something that you look at when you have a kid in front of you, a two month old who's seizing. Uh, this is not of your primary concern. Well, it turns out, we have a bunch of documented effects that were consistent with aerosopathy, but of course everybody will understand here that these are so non-specific, they're not credible, in for the, they have very little diagnostic value. However, it turns out when we re-evaluated under a candidate aerosopathy idea, we actually were able to detect she had gross hair, and this is what some that pleased me a lot, she also had a gut malrotation. So the kiddo had actually um, um, a, a, a GI tube because she was, uh, she was uh, uh, her, you know, her, her, her growth chart was, was just n not great. Um, and it turned out, it, it, it's not because uh, she was failing to feed, she, was, she, she had a structural gut, gut defect. So she had uh, surgery, it was repaired, and that aspect of her pathology uh, improved very well. I mean, this is not a child that is going to do well. We understand this. But the point is, the prior probability that we have predicted this kind of stuff based on genomic uh, hypothesis is very, very low. So even though we have a first in human, we now have a human with consistent features, we have a fish, a fish with consistent fissure, and the reanalysis consistent. You get the idea. So just a summary of the data. So far, we have completed our work in 138 families. And the bottom line is that we actually have what we consider to be triggers in 72%. And I will stand by this number because I understand this is much higher than the 25 to maximum 50% people are reporting. I will absolutely stand by this number. Um, and we suspect that this is because, first of all, we're choosing our families well. We only enroll families that the clinical features are consistent with stuff that we can study in the fish. So we know we have a strong uh, a surrogate. Um, so one very important piece, assay sensitivity. I have sensitivity specificity data, but I do want to talk about the sensitivity data very quickly. Oh, sorry. The bottom line is this. There were a number of families that our work was completely irrelevant because they had known mutations in known genes that, fully, that were fully consistent with their broad clinical presentation. You get the idea. However, we chose not to know that information, and we asked the question, if we do our work agnostically, will we arrive to the correct conclusion? So we had 10 families, and I'm showing you four of them here, that have di fully diagnostic mutations. POMPT2, WDR81, CHD7, ATRX, I'm just showing you four examples. And, in, and I'm very pleased to say that, yes, it is only 10, but hey, it's 10. In each of the 10 cases, we were actually able to zero in on the correct gene using our uh, agnostic approach of testing all the kind of genes that came from the exome. So that is actually body well for the future. So um, I'm not going to talk about this. If, if I can be uh, allowed the privilege of an extra three minutes, I want to talk about this. And it's the last thing I'll say. Who benign alleles. OK. Consider this. We have a two-year-old who has all that stuff. Her family has some means. And they have used these to actually, um, to actually, I'm sorry, what? Okay, thank you. Huh? Oh, thank you. Um, well, so I remember <laughs> when I was a child. <laughs> so, um, this family actually went through um, pretty much the entire eastern seaboard. Uh, and they, they've seen, you know, 20 neurologists, uh, I mean, 50 therapists. You get the idea. Yeah. yeah. All right. So whole exome sequencing is done on this. And we identify the novel mutation in BDG2, first in human. The novel mutation in NOS2, also first in human. And, of course, our classical titan mutation. Okay. Tide is not in, and the kiddo doesn't have cardiomyopathy. So we do functional testing. NOS2 is not giving us a phenotype. It is interesting that the kiddo also have some peculiar allergies and her chloride uh, uh, numbers are a little bit pinched, suggesting that there might be some sort of, sort of CF-like uh, event there. Of course, NOS2 uh, regulates the expression of CFTR, so we're suspicious, but we cannot study lung function, duh, uh, in the fish. Uh, so we actually uh, sent the NOS2 data 
to a different laboratory who actually specializes in this and we'll see if, there's a, if, if, if this poor kid has a twofer. But BDG2 turned out to be interesting. Okay. The BDG2 mutation was valent to methionine. Polyphen said benign. SIFT said it was tolerated. Mutation taster said polymorphism. And I will say here, I will, whoever wants to engage in a bet with me, the bet is um, a case of Cheval Blanc red wine. Those of you who know your red wines, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and the bet is generate a computational algorithm that will predict that this permutation is deleterious. Simple. And I will buy you a case of Cheval Blanc. It's about $12,000, in case you're wondering. Uh, <laughs> If not, I will, I, will, I will drink to your health and future success for a while. <laughs> okay, so why do I say this? So the first test, of course, the kid was microcephalic. So the first test was head circumference. This is what the data looked like. You suppress the gene, you reduce head circumference, you can rescue the phenotype by introducing human mRNA, and then you make human mRNA that is decoding methionine instead of veiling at position 141, and that fails to rescue. These data suggest, this variant is de novo. Um, this, this data suggests that this mutation is loss of function. Okay, let's put it aside. We can actually look at the neurons of the devel during development. Uh, and we can actually see that this is the forebrain right here. This is the two hemispheres. Um, and we can actually see when we hit the gene, we actually get either unilateral expression or, uh, or reduced expression. And we can also rescue this phenotype, but we fail to rescue once again this phenotype with the mutation that we found in the kid. So this assay is also telling us that this mutation is loss of function. And last but not least, we can actually measure the amount of birth of, of neurons in the developing fish embryo. And you get the idea here, right? Once again, this assay tells us that this allele is loss of function. So we have three alleles looking at various aspects of neurogenesis and migration that are telling us that this de novo mutation in this kiddo is pathogenic. Incidentally, uh, uh, in, in the exome variant survey at the time, there were only about two or three rare non-coding variants. We tested a couple of them and both of them were benign. So this gene is, does not, by and large, does not like variation, which is consistent with the idea. So what gives? Here's what gives. Your dog has the, 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 muta the mutation. So does your cat and your kid's hamster and the, your favorite orangutan in the zoo, and if you have an orangutan at home, then uh, <laughs> But uh, you get the idea, right? This is the valine, uh, and actually um, in, the, in, the, in the neuroprimates, everybody's valine, but before that, everybody's methionine. So the reason that this allele is predictably benign, and the reason why I'm pretty confident that I'll be drinking your wine, is because there is 50, 59 species, I believe, that we have already, over the species of, of the 100 vertebrates that we've sequenced, 59 of the 100, have the bloody methionine. So how can you possibly have a child that has this methionine and is so sick when you have dogs, cats, squirrels, dolphins, and everything else encode this? Okay? There's two possibilities. Possibility, I'm full of crap. <laughs> and possibility number two is that there's something else going on. And of course there's something else going on. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here all cockily telling you about the story now. <laughs> okay. There's something called compensation, and we've known this since the lac eye operon, the bacterial work back in the day. So the idea is very simple. The idea is that here you have your protein, and you hit your protein with mutation number one, it changes its conformation or whatnot, and then you actually hit it with a second mutation, and the second mutation is able to restore the conformation or the function of the protein. This has been known in bacteria and, 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 and many prokaryotes. And it's actually, we have actually known this about a, about a, of a, a couple of enzymes in, in vertebrates and mammals as well. Okay, so the question then became, how could we potentially find compensatory mutations and test the hypothesis in this particular kid? Now, here's a scary thing I'll tell you. If you take all your favorite human pathogenic mutations and you go to HEMD and ClinVar, I understand that they're, they're both full of interesting annotations in them. <laughs> uh, but the bottom line is that you will find that approximately 10% of pathogenic mutations in humans are fixed in at least one other species. Okay? 10%, one out of 10. And I assure you that these are not annotational errors. Maybe the odd one is, but the majority of them are not. We've looked really hard. So the idea is 
that our human pathogenic variant has a passenger in another species that is protecting it, it's shielding it from its pathogenic body. It has a, uh, you know. So how are we gonna find this? Okay, so imagine this asparagine that is mutated to allergen in human disease. What we're looking for, uh, uh, and we look at the species that have the alanine, and we ask the question, what are the changes within the same protein are actually traveling with the, with the alanine to protect it? Am I making sense here? Okay. And then we can actually test this. And in this particular case, you know, we have this alanine and this, we have these candid sites. They always seem to be traveling with the alanine. So our hypothesis is that this lysine or glutamate or valine are actually somehow shielding the alanine's detrimental effect. This only works obviously for missus mutation, not for non mutation. How are we going to test this? We're going to test this by taking, uh, deriving this list of mutations, introducing them into the mutant human mRNA, and asking the question whether these things can rescue. And I got to tell you, some of my students have produced some awful experiments. Sometimes they produce some really cool ones, and this is why I do science, because it's days like these that I cherish, that they're like the apple of my eye. So here's an experiment. Um, the, um, the assay we're looking at is fully quantitative. We're counting the total number of birth neurons in, in, in fish embryos. So this is, you know, unambiguous. We, we're counting the number of dots, and that's it. So here is the median number of neurons over a few hundred embryos, and this is what happens when we suppress BDG2, and this is what happens when we rescue BDG2, and this is what happens when we rescue BDG2 with a valine 141 methionine. Okay, so loss of function. And then we take the methionine mRNA and we introduce one at a time the entire allelic series that we have found of potential travelers across the, the, the species. And check this out. If, I'm sorry, this is cool. <laughs> um, if you introduce lysine at position 80 or valine at position 128, you completely restore function. You convert a null protein into a fully functional protein. I mean, so actually the paper just came out. Um, so, and, and I can tell you that uh, if those of you interested, please go in there because we've actually built a computational algorithm that you can access to, it's free, of course, um, that will actually predict some compensatory sites that it might be worth beating up a little bit. So we think that this has, uh, you know, it, of course it has a cool factor, but actual, uh, actually has potential innate value because it might, in time, help us improve the predictive power of some of these computational algorithms because I would really like not to be able to have to do fish all the time. Okay, I'm going to shut up, and, and I'm just going to leave you with a couple points. The first one is that I think it's a, it's a no-brainer that functional studies will inform the context-dependent effect of alleles. Um, the important thing is when we do functional studies, in my mind, is that we need to get them done in the right context and we need to be able to measure the sensitivity and the specificity of every assay that we execute. Now, in our group, I can tell you that we actually incorporate specificity and sensitivity measurements and reporting back into a research report that we deliver to the physicians and to the patients. And we do discuss with our patients the fish data, what they mean, the potential pitfalls, making sure but and, and it works very, very well. And we, make a, we take a lot of time to think about how the specificity of the assay might be and, and the relevance might be. You know, because I'm sorry, but testing protein stability in HEC-293 cells or some artificial thing, I've done it, I've published it, I'm not proud of it. Um, it's the best we could do at the time, but we can do much better now, and we should do much better right now. I also want to, before we you know, get all excited about this, I really need to make sure that people fully understand that this is not a panacea. The reason that we have experienced a lot of success is I think because we made some um, reasonable choices about the type of patients that we study, the type of assets that we execute, and we have a pretty reasonable idea. We, we're searching for our limitations all the time. So of course, we only study phenotypes with proximal quantitative surrogates. Sometimes we sort of veered off the park a little bit and we've had some successes and some spectacular failures. We are limited by the presence of orthologs. Now in pediatric and neonatal disorders, we're actually able to find a hook about 80% of the time. So that's not too bad, but it's not 100%. And we are subject to evolutionary compatibility. Unless we're able to rescue the zebrafish phenotype with human mRNA, we do not have an assay. And that fails about 5, 10% of the time. And sometimes we actually have real uh, nightmares because um, 
So, you know, GAR, SARS, MARS, VARS, uh, all these things uh, that, that cause a number of leukodystrophies. It turns out that we couldn't um, suppress them efficiently in the fish, and the human mRNA and the zebrafish mRNA, I'm sorry, the proteins, heterodimerized to make a really toxic byproduct. So this was, a, this was unfortunately a horrible experience. But we, do pre but we learn from it. We, we learn where the edges are. So our current projection is that we can actually study about 70% of the pediatric morbid genome, and we're moving post-haste to study that, and about 30 to 40% of adult onset disorders. Um, so we're all hanging by a thread here. <laughs> Um, but um, this is the Motley crew. Um, actually, this is not the whole Motley crew. This is the Motley group who were brave enough to go ziplining with, with their, with their, with their uh, fierce leader. Um, um, but uh, actually, you know what? I do the email and, and a few slides, and they do all the work. So um, without this lot, nothing happens. Um, so I'm, I'm deeply grateful. It's, uh, it's, it's really fun going to work every day, I have to tell you. Um, and the other thing is, uh, in addition to some key individuals in the lab, there's a lot of, one, one thing I'm really uh, both humbled by and proud of is the, the fact that we've been able to engage so many clinical colleagues to this, who come to the meetings, who help us think about the patient, who think us think about um, additional clinical testing, outcomes, new measurements, who push us all the time, call us out when they think we're talking bullshit, which does happen. Um, and I think it's just, it's, just, uh, it's just wonderful. And this is just, I'm sure I'm, I'm missing people, but this is just a snapshot of the individuals who have been participating in this offer, and that's awesome. And last but not least, uh, I do have to put in a plug. We've got this pitching new space, and we're hiring. So thank you. <laughs> Questions? How's that for caffeine? Eh? <laughs> yeah, I, I, that was really cool. It, it, it just, it just is. So the one, one question, two questions. One is, uh, how long between the exome to when you get the fish data? And the second one is, is there a database that we can see what you guys are coming up yeah, with? Yeah, so, so that, thank you for that. Or can we submit cases that we have to potentially yeah. get them on your list? Thank you. I, I, can, I, can, I can answer all these questions. Uh, so uh, how long? It depends. Less than it used to be. Um, <laughs> it really depends. Okay. So some genes turn out to be, there's a couple of areas. The first area is I already have, so my, 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 my vision, I hate using that word, but I don't have another one. Um, my vision is to actually develop essentially the sigma catalog of functional assays, right? So if you come to me with a gene that we already have an assay for, we'll look at weeks three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, depending on the workload, okay? If it's a new set of genes that are coming out, it could still be three to four, six weeks because the gene behaves, or it could be two years, right? So we have a couple of transcripts that we're looking at that are nightmares. There was one particular construct we've been working with that we couldn't make the plasmid. It recombined. Every time we cloned it, it freaking recombined and it deleted 300 base pairs at random. So we've ha had to find some exotic bacterial strain to get it done in. So that, just making the plasmid lost us six months. For other things, it goes a lot more smoothly. So I guess my answer is it depends. Um, on median, we think the functional testing is on average about three to six months, which is about what Gene DX does to return data these days. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing to say is that we also are very fortunate. We are working, um, uh, uh, we are depositing some of our data in Decipher, um, and we, we are now continuously posting our stuff on Gene Matcher as well. Um, and we've had some good success with these things. So there is this. Um, database wise, um, this is something that's on our docket. We're just very low on bandwidth, but we would really like to uh, at least put out there. So we are writing our first task force paper. Uh, with the first hundred families, and of course all this data will be freely available, and we're hoping to... Uh, most of our families, interesting, about 90% of our families want the exomes uploaded in dbGaP and whatnot. They are very motivated, and they do not fully understand what the big fuss is about. Like, I got a sick kid. I, I really don't have time to be thinking about your stupid regulatory stuff. Other people take a different view, but uh, um, all of these decisions are driven by... All the decisions are driven by patients, and these are very... I mean, these people will read you under the table. Um, so, um, and, and yes, we do uh, consider uh, uh, cases, uh, it's on a collaborative basis, obviously, 
um, and you just email people and then sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, depending on what. So the one thing we don't do, I'll tell you, is that we don't, we've had a poor experience with, we've X from this kid and we have this variant that we really like. We've all done that and we've gotten burned. Sometimes the variant, many times I should say, the variant that we really like is the variant that drives the pathology and sometimes it's not. So we had one example where I just, if I can take one minute to say this, where uh, a colleague contacted us by email with X from this kid and it's a, it's a, it's a consanguineous family. There's a nice block of homozygosity. We have a homozygous nonsense mutation in this gene and it's expressed in the right place. You know this. We worked on this gene and we couldn't get a phenotype at all for a couple of months. And then we said, okay, was there anything, can you, you was there anything else? Like, well. <laughs> there was this missense allele, but it's a missense, right? I mean, a nonsense is much better. So it turns out that the missense allele, that gene, was reproducing the child's pathology. The missense allele was functionally low. You get the idea. So we've learned that if we want to, we, we love collaborating with people. We, we host guest scientists all the time. Uh, the, at the center, we have a median of six to ten uh, visiting scientists every year. Um, they tend to spend from a few weeks to a few months, depending on what the projects are. Sometimes it's a good experience, sometimes it's not such a good experience. Sometimes you just get frustrated, sometimes they get truly illuminated. Um, and, uh, but we want to study whole exome. So if an exome comes to us with the cool gene, we want the VCF files, we want you know, look at everything on IGV, we want everything done because we've been burned a few times. So I'm sorry, it's, the answer is longer than was warranted, but. Great. Thank you.